What's up, guys? I'm nobody special, and I have back with us today my buddy Travis from the Real Estate Mindset channel. And Travis has some fantastic stuff for us today. He's done a couple of videos recently where he's been going through some subdivisions in his home state of Texas, and he's noticed he's he's used the phrase shadow inventory, and he's he's noticed how we've got a lot of price cuts on new home builds in Texas. And what you see on the MLS and on the real estate websites is not necessarily what you see when you drive through these neighborhoods. Travis, how are you doing today, brother? I am good, Jack. Happy Sunday to you. Uh, hopefully you had a great weekend with the family. And, I did. Uh, yeah. It's nice to be back. Well, thank you for coming back. Now, Travis, these videos you just did these last couple of days, they were, they were eye-opening. Tell, tell me what you saw. I mean, what what is this shadow inventory concept? What are they doing? Okay, so you know, and there, there's a lot to that that I'll go over. You know, outside the shadow inventory, like the price cuts. But as far as like the specific shadow inventory, Jack, basically what I was trying to do is just show the viewers the lack of transparency and the lack of regulation when it pertains to new construction. And essentially, I was able to because I'm a licensed realtor, I was able to pull up the MLS, the Multiple Listing Service, and show the viewers, uh, for example. Uh, community that had only say 50 homes listed for sale as active or under contract. But when I go out to the communities and I drive around boots on the ground and I actually, and this is so boring. Okay. And I count one, two, three, just so we get beyond a shadow of doubt. Right. Um, you know, there's certain communities, subdivisions that are a little bit more in distress that have as much as three times more inventory than what is actually being listed on MLS. Again, lack of transparency, lack of regulation. So th there's a lot more inventory than what's even being reported in the data when it pertains to new construction. Well, okay. So what you're seeing then, you know, because back up a little bit, most people, especially, you know, the housing bulls out there, the, the bull case for housing or the case against a housing crash has been a lack of inventory all along. The reason why home prices aren't outright crashing nationwide is because there's just not enough inventory. And you're telling us that the inventory is actually a lot more than they're advertising. Am, am I missing something? So there, there is inventory and those prices um, are starting to come down. Check there. I mean, if, if we talk about the golden handcuff effect and what would happen when rates go to six and 5% and a million, you know, active existing listings overnight, you know, we talked about STR, short-term rental, the bans and how much inventory that would create. But, you know, just looking at new construction, you know, we don't even know, Jack, we don't even know how much inventory there's, I lost count. There's literally way more inventory than what's re being reported. We don't know the difference in a home that's completed, ready to be sold versus one that needs a piece of sod to be completed, right? So, you know, what you know, what I would say to the bulls is, you know, I understand inventory is important. Uh, but in the places that are, you know, do have inventory right now, I mean, we're seeing these price cuts happen right now. And it's only a matter of time before the existing home market catches up. Again, if something bad happens, say, you know, rates go down in 2025 because these new home builders aren't building anymore, right? Say they got rid of their inventory. It's just sitting there. They stopped building. We need them to continue to, to continue to build. But say they stop building, something bad happens. The Fed lowers interest rates. Say mortgage rates go to low sixes, high 5% because something bad happens. Well, then now we have an, a million more existing homes up for sale, which is a domino effect. It's a doom loop. So I think that new home builders are in, I think they're in, some pretty serious trouble, brother. I mean, I don't, I think that the high interest rates blindsided them. I don't think they expected 8% interest rates. I think that in their minds, they can continue to push the high prices onto the consumer and that the consumer could afford it. But we don't see that. And honestly, if you look at the median sales price uh, for especially the four week rolling average, you see that the top four metro areas with year over year price decline are in Texas. And we have yeah. almost the most new home building in any other state. So I understand the point with inventory. Inventory is important, but we're still on this plane ride, man. And there's still things that are changing right before our eyes, but I'm not going to say inventory is not important. Now you mentioned golden handcuffs there. And I, I think probably most of the viewers understand the concept of golden handcuffs, but for some of the other folks, you know, right now, new homes is such a, 
it has such an outsized effect on the housing market because of the concept of golden golden handcuffs and what it's done to existing home sales. Could you describe that a little bit and what do golden handcuffs mean? It basically means that people don't want to list their home for sale because, for example, they have a 3% interest rate or, say, a 4% interest rate and on top, not just the interest rate. They also probably have $150,000 in equity, which means if they sold their house and they were to go purchase another house, which 75% of people do, by the way, if they were to do that, it would be substantially more expensive to become a homeowner. For example, if I were to sell my rental house that I have right now, it would cost, you know, the mortgage payment would probably be double. So my mortgage payment would probably go from $2,000 to $4,000. So yes, I would pocket my $150,000. But unfortunately, my mortgage payment would go up $2,000. And most people, Jack, they can't qualify. They can't get a mortgage if the mortgage payment goes up $2,000. Most people are purchasing houses maximum DTI. So they're maxing out their debt to income ratio when rates were 3 and 4% and home values were $150,000 less. So you bring them in this environment, you know, quite frankly, they're, they're chained to their houses. A lot of people are because of the lack of affordability. And that was, that was, you hit the nail right on the head there. Chained to their houses. You got a low mortgage, two and a half, three percent. It's a great problem to have, hence yeah, the golden in the golden handcuffs. But at the same time, you're stuck there because if you sell it, if you capitalize on that boom in home prices, well, now you got to go live somewhere else. The handcuffs comes from the, the point that you're trapped in that house because you can't afford a similar sized house or you can't afford to upsize or to move. So you know, a lot, if you were lucky enough to refinance at those low rates, great. You're you're still though you're stuck there, and so now you don't have so many existing homes on the market, which means the home the home market, the home prices, the real estate market as a whole is more determined by what's going on in new homes, in new builds. It's a bigger percentage of all of the home sales that's happening than in typical markets because of this golden handcuff phenomenon. And that's why what you discovered with the shadow inventory, I think, is really important and people need to understand this. So take it away, brother. What do we tell us about the shadow inventory? Show us what you found. Well, real quick, though, just just to go back on the sales, um, it depends on the metro area. Most metro areas, Jack, they're going to have more existing sales versus new construction sales. I'm just really blessed, man, because I live in Texas and I could literally go outside my house and drive to 10 different new construction communities. But when we look at other places that have a tighter market, say like San Diego, man, you right. can't, where are you going to build in San Diego, the side of a hill? I mean, there's nowhere to build. So, uh, you know, I, I just, you know, I want to confirm there, there are some metro areas they don't have new construction. It's a little tighter over there. Uh, again, you know, like for example, San Diego, the price drops happen in San Diego, not as a result, in my opinion, of, as new from new construction, but primarily as a result of unaffordability. Right. Um, so again, now that rates are at 8%, things are only going to get worse. So all of the data I'm going to show you, Jack, remember, this is 7% data. We're in we're in 8% right now. So this data is going to get a lot worse. So uh, yeah, if you want to throw up my screen, I'll get started. Now, a couple of things that I want to highlight as I'm doing this presentation. One of the things being that is new home builders are offering ridiculous buying incentives right now, Jack. One of the buying incentives that they're offering is fixed rate mortgages that are 3% under market value. And you see that right here from Polte. Now, Polte is the third biggest new home builder in the country. They're offering, as you can see, again, a 4.75. And not only are they offering that, the number two home builder in America, Lennar, is also offering a fixed rate of 4.75%, 3% under market value. That is astonishing. Plus, you can see here, they're also offering $10,000 towards closing costs and $40,000 in price reductions. But not only that, there's more. On top of that, they are so desperate. Okay, These new home builders are so desperate to sell their houses right now. Again, welcome to the 8%. Let me show you what the 8% are doing right now. Okay, What you see on your screen right now is the 8%. What I just showed you, is also a result of the 8%, to be honest with you. They're offering a 5% buyer's commission. You can see that right here, 5%. So if someone sells this house, if I bring my buyer to this new home builder, I get paid almost double my normal commission of 3%. And they pay me 5%. It is remarkable. But not only that, there's more, okay? The price cuts. 
Jack, these price cuts are insane. Now, obviously, this is in Houston. Every market is special. But when I go to Houston, look at this price cut on the left here. This price cut represents a price cut of $69,000. That's 21%. This is happening right now. This is the result of 8%. To the right, right here, this went from 316, 640 to 250,000. That's a reduction, Jack, of $66,000 and also represents 20 one percent and when i scroll down here i mean you see this is happening in multiple price points you know here's a lower price point at you know started at 274,000. it's now price cut to 215,000. that's fifty nine thousand dollars, or rather 21.6 percent price cut and that's not counting again the ridiculous buying incentives and this is going on around the nation when we look at fred economic data this is fred economic data so this is really looking at the big picture i showed you a local housing market here's the big picture now when we look at the big picture we can see that new homes never were able to sustain the value of the homes the prices dropped even with these ridiculous buying incentives that i just showed you three percent under market five percent buyers incentives 21 percent you know price cuts they can't sustain, probably as a result of the price cuts, am I right? But the buying incentives couldn't sustain. We peaked in October of 2022. We peaked at $496,800 right now. Okay, this updated, what? Four days ago, this updated from filming this anyways. It updated to $418,800. That is a drop of $78,000 and a loss of 15.7% percent. My base minimum to say that prices are crashing is 15 percent. So I'll go on record and say the prices of new homes are crashing right now because they're down from peak 15.7 percent. But if you just want to look at year over year, Jack, if we just look at September 2022, September 2022, uh, the median sales price was 477,700. Okay, so that would represent a loss from September to September, year over year, of $58,900, or rather 12.3%. And again, I can't stress this enough, brother. This is without counting the buying incentives. You're supposed to remove the buying incentives out of the value of the house. When we calculate value for existing home sales, you take the, the appraiser goes out to appraise the property, but they remove buying incentives off of the appraisal value. So if the seller's paying $10,000 in closing costs, but they sell their house for $400,000, the home is really worth three ninety. dollars So they're not doing that right here. And that's what I'm trying to say. These price, the lack of price sustainability is not even factoring in the buying incentives. 3% under market for these rates. Do you see so what I'm saying? We're, we're, we're drinking from the fire hose right now. There, there was a lot there. Let me let me try to recap what we just went through because, wow, 4.75% uh, mortgages when the average 30-year mortgage right now is over 8%. Now, the banks are not loaning that to these people at 4.75%. That is the seller is paying down the interest rate. And they're doing that to artificially keep the price up, right? Am I... That's correct. What's that? What they're doing? Okay. Okay. So <laughs> te technically you're right. Okay. So like I'm a loan officer and a realtor and I have to abide by RESPA laws, Jack, real estate, Selling procedure act. And, um, they don't because they're categorized as the seller. So they can steer you to the mortgage company. And it's actually, it's not them offering the incentive. It's the mortgage company offering the incentive, right? Which they own jack they they own the mortgage they are the mortgage company it's a joke they so own nobody's the actually company. loaning money at 4.75 percent it's just the difference in the interest is being made up by it ends up being the builder he's it's doing it through subsidiaries he's doing it through contracts and other side deals but it's you know the price of money is the price of money they're artificially lowering the interest rates and it's at the 100%. expense of the seller, and the seller is happy to do that because he can still advertise the higher prices, and so the comps aren't coming down for the other properties he's selling in the same neighborhood. And they can afford to do it. That, that's the thing. There, there's so much built into the these houses. They can afford to cut the prices 20%, uh, offer a rate 3% under market value, give you a 5% commission to bring your buyers there, and they still make a profit. 
And now, but that's not the only thing they're doing. You also said they're offering 10,000 in closing costs. Again, that's coming out of the seller's pocket, right? So it's, again, tech, it's, they, they say it's out of the, the seller's price. pocket. I'm sorry. They could just lower the price and not offer the $10,000 in incentives and it would be the same effect, but because they have other properties for sale, they don't want to lower that sticker price. That's and the then, premise. They don't want to. That's the premise. Even though we just looked at property that point, I mean, 20, a 20% 20 price cut on a listing is substantial. And they're also offering above average commissions to the buying agents. They're offering 5% commissions. So they are bribing the buying agents to bring them demand. They're overpaying for a limited supply of demand. So again, they could just lower the prices and the buying agents will come to them, but they're not doing that. They're just doing these little side deals that keeps the prices artificially high. All that stuff that they're doing, the 10,000 in closing costs, the higher commissions to the buyer's agents, the buying down the interest rates, and yet the prices are still falling Median average home price has fallen to fit, fallen. What did you say? 15.7% from its peak. So even all this stuff they're doing, it's not enough to keep the prices up because at the end of the day, it's about affordability and there just isn't any. That's right. And if that wasn't bad enough, if, and I'll show you the, you know, if you want, let me show you the shadow inventory. So basically what I'm showing you right now is a new home build community on MLS, the multiple listing service. Okay. And I actually did the video based on this community and you can see in the upper left right here, Jack, that there are 43 homes that are active. Now, if we were to count homes under contract, it would be more like 53. But what I wanted to point out is when I was, you know, went there and I drove around all of these streets, hold on one second, all of these streets right here that you see, okay, that only have like one home here, or one home here, all of these streets have homes that are already built. Even though this is saying 43 homes available, when I walked it, there was over 150 homes, 150 homes. Every one of these houses is built, okay? It's not, again, it's not showing it here active on MLS, but when I go there, over 150. I think it was more like 180. And this is happening all over the place. We have three times in certain subdivisions, not all, and I'll acknowledge that, not all the subdivisions, but in many subdivisions, we have three times more inventory than what's even being listed at MLS. And the only way to figure that out is you got to walk the community, right? So I went out of my way to go into this area because I was like, I wonder what's over here, right? And so when I went over there, I'm like, oh my gosh. Everything is practically done being built. It's it's really it's really quite astonishing if you do that. Do you guys so have a lot of it's not on builds? MLS though? It's so, not on MLS. You know, we saw something similar with vehicles. It was about a year, a year and a half ago. Uh, there's a guy who runs a big automotive channel on YouTube called Lucky Lopez, and he did a video yeah. about how all these repo lots were overflowing with cars because car repossessions were on the way up but the banks were seizing all these cars they didn't want to sell them all at once in the into the auctions because they knew it would have crashed the value so they withheld the supply it delayed the crash but it didn't stop it used car prices just absolutely tanked over the last year and a half and it looks like what you're describing here with mls saying there's 43 homes for sale in this neighborhood you go drive the neighborhood, there's actually 150 They're doing the same thing with new build houses. They're withholding inventory to artificially keep prices higher. And that's on top of all the other things we just talked about with the buy down of the mortgage rates and the higher uh, commissions and the 10,000 at closing costs. So it seems, it seems they're just trying every trick under the sun to just keep that sticker price up. Because again, real estate comps is the big deal, right? If you offer all this other crap that costs you $75,000, $80,000 to get the sale done, but the actual sale price is still higher, when somebody goes and looks at the comps to sell the next house, they're going to see your artificially high sale price. They're not going to see all the goodies that you had to throw in to sweeten the pot to get that deal done. You, you know, I'll say though, uh, Jack, that they've actually been cutting prices since October. I mean, when we look at the chart, the median sales price chart, you know, if, if we really look at this, it stopped working in October. Like I, I asked myself, like how like fast would this really be dropping without those incentives? So it, it's taking what I'm 
saying is, it's like for the last year, it's taken both buying incentives and price cuts. They they have to cut the prices. And what that's doing is completely destroying anyone right here. Anyone that purchased basically in 2022 is doomed because now their home is no longer worth what they paid for. This is going on right now. So I'm again asking myself, what happens when the recession is confirmed? What happens when employment becomes unhinged? They keep talking higher for longer. Where where is inflation the worst? Part of the worst is it's shelter. So they have their eyes on this. They're not telling us, oh, we need deflation. We just, disinflation's okay, but we need deflation in the housing market. And all I'm seeing happening here is, you know, builders that have enough profit built into the homes to sustain elevated overpriced houses for at least going on a year, right? So, but again, they can't even do that because it's lost 15%. So I think this is a disaster just waiting to happen, man. And I think that in some metro areas and sub subdivisions, it's going to be like a Las Vegas ghost town, depending on the subdivision. Amazing. So, I mean, the everybody's saying, when is housing going to crash? It's already crashing. You're just not seeing it. Well, I mean, you see it here, a 15% drop in the chart. But if you were to also add in all the other incentives and the buy downs of the rates and everything else, if you were to quantify that and add it to this chart, you're going to see a much bigger drop, aren't you? It's already yeah. crashing. They're just doing everything they can to say it's just a gully, right? That's yeah. basically what that's telling us. And, and, and so I asked myself, okay, so we have the perfect recipe for balance to come back, which is basically, unfortunately, people will get hurt. I understand that. But it's kind of something we need to happen because, you know, technically only about 13% of American households can afford a house, only 13%. So my question is, is okay, well, the builders are going to eventually wake up, right? They're going to eventually stop building. Now, when that happens, maybe again, something bad happens, the Fed lowers interest rates and say, okay, builders start building again. But remember the golden handcuff effect. So you know, going back into, are they still building? Take a look at where we're at from right now compared to where we're at pre-pandemic. So starting with permits, Jack. So as you can see here with permits, we have 1.47 million permits being pulled. Okay. Now that's way off of peak. We peaked actually in December of 2021 at close to 2 million. So it is down. So they're not as excited. So it is slowing down. But when we look at December of 2019 right here, so pre-COVID, we see that we're about the same. So we're still where we're at pre-COVID when it comes to permits. Now, moving on to actual starts for total units. Now, total units started is 1.35 million. Now, if we go back here to December, again, pre-COVID, we were sitting at 1.55 million. So we are lower. But I also think it's very interesting that kind of skyrocket up there from November to December. So maybe it's not, you know, really that's where we're at. But regardless, total units started is high. Okay, 10 years, if you look at the 10 year chart, it's a 10 year chart, it's still high, not quite where we were at pre pandemic. Now, take a look at under construction, and here's where things get really, really crazy. So, now who knows if these houses are complete? I, I think, honestly, Jack, some of these houses are completed, but they're just not saying they're completed because they do not want to pay the taxes on the dwelling. They're happy paying property taxes on dirt value. But right here, and this goes back to what, 19, the 1960s almost. So January of 1970, we have more housing units under construction than we have in history, in history. But what's interesting to point out is let's see, you know, let's break this down. Okay. So if we look at under construction, as far as apartments, right, or five units or more, look at this. The reason right. I think this is important is, is because this is going to hit hard the long-term rental market. Right now under construction, we have 986,000 basically rental units under construction. So as it starts and continues to hit the rental market, obviously that's going to put continued pressure downward on rent. And we can already see that in asking rents. There's already deflation numbers in asking rents, depending on the metro area. But when we keep going to actual uh, units completed, take a look at this. Okay, this is huge. So this is total units actually computed. Completed. So we're sitting at 1.45 million, and this is seasonally adjusted completing completed units. So again, not only do we have a whole bunch of inventory right now, we have a whole bunch of inventory. We still have a whole bunch of homes that are being completed under construction, started and permitted. And take a look at this. Okay, here's just the single family residences. 
It's SFR. I don't. Some people say SFH, single family home. Uh, but we have a million, Jack, million units, single family completed. So again, I'm asking, do we really have 2 million? Do we have 3 million? Because this is just completed. This is what they're probably paying taxes on. But what about all the other homes that I showed you in those videos? What about the other 100 homes that are sitting there without one piece of sod? So maybe we have 2 million. I don't know, but it's really crazy. And look at this. This is the completed for five units or more. This is all over the place. Um, it's sitting at 445,000. Uh, but regardless, you know, we got a lot going on with new construction. I believe that new construction is going to lead the way with price crashing. I think that's why we see Texas is, you know, having the top four metro areas with year over year median four week rolling average median sales price decline. All of them are in Texas. Texas has the most new construction building. So again, I think they're blindsided by the 8% interest rates. I think that people need to understand when it comes to new homes, Jack, there's always going to be forced selling. People ask, where's the forced selling? Where's the distressed selling? Well, new home builders must sell their houses. I'm telling you right now, there's hyper supply right now with new homes. There's hyper in most metro areas, not all, most metro areas, hyper supply new homes. They, they're forced to sell. They have unfavorable financing conditions. They have unfavorable fees and things that they have to pay if they don't sell their houses. So what's going to happen is as they sit, guess what they're going to have to do to sell the houses? Prices have to go down even more. The 20% price cut that I showed you, that 20% price cut, it's not enough. If it was, it would be sold. Now, let's look talk a little bit about those those build statistics and the and you know, the under construction, the completed. I heard you a couple of times mention that the metaphor of the one piece of sod, right? What tell me about that piece of sod to keep the home from becoming completed? Why would a builder do that? Okay, because the tax. Okay, so think of the tax liability, and this is something that like new home build. I'm sorry, new home buyers and people that are purchasing new homes have to be very careful about because if a loan officer doesn't properly set up their escrow account to account in for future property tax assessment, a homeowner could be blindsided by a ten thousand dollar bill. So the reason why these new home builders are doing it is, is because they're only paying property taxes on the dirt, okay? And the dirt may be valued at $10,000. Well, the thing is, the moment that that home is completed, it now is a dwelling. So the county will instead go back out and reassess that parcel as if it was com a completed dwelling. And so now the tax liability may be on, instead of 20,000, Jack, it may be on 400,000. And some of these new home building communities, like the one I just showed you, 3.4% tax rate. So would they rather pay 3.4% on 20,000 or 10,000 or 400,000? And that tax assessor doesn't care if the home sold or if it's still sitting on the balance sheet of the builder, if it's done, it's assessed at the value of the dwelling, not just the land. Is that correct? So I'm sure that they do care, right? But you know, I'm, I'm not 100% sure on how they're getting away with it. I don't, I don't know how they're getting away with it, but I know that they will push it to the very end. Uh, and honestly, I believe that they're only assessing it at the beginning of the preceding year, right? So uh, again, you'll see a lot of inventory come on the market at the end of the year, I think as a requirement for them to pay taxes. But the thing is, is that's a requirement, right? What, what's, what's the reality of the data? How much new construction do we have? Do we have hyper supply? Do we really have 10 months, 11 months, 12 months? There's no way of us knowing that with, again, the lack of transparency and the lack of regulation, but there, there's a lot out there, man. So let's, let's talk about, you had that chart of months of supply that we looked yeah. at before. And mm -hmm. You know, that's again, the, the inventory count was a big deal. A lot of people have been talking about there's not enough inventory. Now we've actually seen supply. It rose pretty substantially last year and then it came back down a little bit. So what, what are you seeing in the chart between the lines here? What was going on in 21 and 22 as that months of supply was increasing there? And then it seems like it peaked. What was that right around the start of 23 and it came Easy. down? What was that? That is an easy question, man. I thought you'd ask a hard question. Well, there's two things that you see there. Okay, so you see this run-up right here in supply? Came right. about right here? Okay, quantitative tightening started March of 2022. Okay, so that was the first thing. So, okay, quantitative tightening happened. Now, why did it go down? What happened shortly after the quantitative tightening? 
builders started offering ridiculous buying. Remember when, when we were in the lockdowns, Jack, they had the nerve to put people on waiting lists with earnest money deposits, man. They were, they look at how low it got. It only got to three months, dude. So they're doing whatever they want, whatever they want. And they're like, oh my God, quantitative tightening is in here. So now what we have to do is offer, you know, they start with the rate buy downs, but the rate buy downs stopped working. Okay. So then they went from rate buy downs to 30 year fixed rate mortgages, 3% under market and 15% price cuts. And that's why you see this go down. Okay. So, so right again, now we're at months of supply. How many months is that? I'm having a hard time seeing 6. the actual. 9. We're at 6.9 right now in order for a buyer's market to be there and confirmed. Generally you need over six months of supply. And we've had over six months of supply for over a year. And as we've just discovered with your, your drive throughs on some of those sub developments, there's actually way more supply out there than is being advertised. So we actually have probably realistically more than 6.9 months of supply at the moment. I mean, if you had to, if you had to quantify it, and I know every metro area is different. It's not going to be the same as in Texas as it is in New York or as in Florida. What would you say the actual supply of housing is out there right now? I would say my, my audio is cutting out a little bit. Can you hear me? I can hear you fine. Yep. I, I would I would say we have over a year of inventory for new homes. And I would say in certain subdivisions, Jack, we have a year to two years of inventory. I think that's the reality. I don't think that the builders want to show that. I think that's why I was also able to show that a lot of homes that said that they were sold were probably not sold. One community that I went to listed five homes under contract, but when I actually drove the property, there was something like 40 or 50 houses that said sold, but no moving trucks, not a single moving truck was there. So you know, I go back to the question, did I know they were sold or not sold? Well, I'm safely assuming they were not sold because there's no data on it. But then I go back to the thing, well, that's why we need the transparency. They, the new home builders have their own housing market. New home builders are doing their own thing, lack of regulation. And it's, you know, they're really putting a bandaid on a bullet hole at this point. Wow. So, I mean, that was a pretty, pretty substantial data point you just gave us there saying that if you had to handicap it, it would be about a year. And again, every housing market, every metro area is different, right? So this this is going to be more biased towards the areas where there's a lot of building, not so much in the cases like the Northeast, the old time cities. Um, but could you zoom out this chart a little bit so that we include the GFC and the housing collapse? Because if you're saying we're probably a little closer to a year, there's that peak in the global financial crisis. What did the inventory peak at? During the GFC. Okay, so so in the GFC at the peak. Now remember, this was deeply in the recession. So you can't compare where we're at right now compared to where they were at deeply in the recession. But it peaked at one year. It peaked at 12 months. I'm sorry, it peaked at 12.2 months in January of 2009. But right before, if we look at like you know, right before that recession, Jack, literally like a couple months before, they're sitting at 8.2. June of 2007, they were sitting at 8.2. And then when the, with the, you know, and then when the recession hits, it goes up, it skyrockets upward. If you go back and you look at pretty much every recession, minus this one here, the, the dot com bubble, uh, it did go up a little bit, but nothing like some of these other recessions where it really skyrocketed. So it's safe to assume that when we do enter the recession, this is gonna skyrocket and it may skyrocket bad. And the fact that it already went down before the recession hit. I mean, there it's, there's turbulence, man. I mean, there's turbulence. This is a toxic market. It's not sustainable. We're seeing things fall apart. And I tell people look no further than new construction where we've been waiting on STRs the short-term rentals. Remember last time I came on here, you know, we looked at that, but that's taking time. We have the inventory right now with new construction, poorly built, poorly built new construction. So that was another good segue there. You talked about the short-term rentals. Right, because we did a whole video on that a few weeks ago, which was amazing, by the way. I mean, the the size of the potential inventory from in cities where there are Airbnb bans going into effect, and there's like three or four times as many short term rentals as there are homes for sale on the market at the moment. Um, now, bring back up that chart of multifamily construction. 
So that's another thing there. Multifamily construction at an all-time high on this chart. At the same time, we've got Airbnb and Verbo bans, STR bans going into effect in a lot of cities. Well, that means there's a lot of single-family homes that are about to become long-term rentals or homes for sale. At the same time, look at all of this multifamily construction that's going on right now at an all-time high. Now, we've also got this commercial real estate bubble potentially happening as office space and retail space. Now, multifamily residential has been kind of the silver lining in that gray cloud there. But if you factor in the Airbnb bans, the STR bans, and all of the multifamily residential that's under construction, that's all going to turn into short-term rentals. Well, we have got a tidal wave of supply that's about to hit the short-term rental market. That would drive down the short-term rental prices, which I think most people could use that break right now. Rents are killing people around the country. But think about all those, how many units do you own, bro, guys out there who bought everything under the sun, leveraged up to the hilt to buy houses to rent, and the cash flow on those properties is about to fall out from underneath them, and they're going to be left with just the debt pile that they're sitting on. So. That's another thing to watch out for, that big spike in construction. And I mean, compare that to leading up to the GFC. I mean, where were we around 2007, 2008 on this chart? Half, Not even comparable. Less than half, 410. Yeah. So, I mean, we're just, there. there is no historical comparison to what we're seeing right now in multifamily construction. Right. And again, that's the better performing of the commercial real estate category. So, you know, prices, yeah. I mean, I mean, let's summarize this. Prices are falling. There, you showed us median rent. The median sales price is down 15% from its highs. So prices are falling. You've got all these side deals going on that the builders are throwing in there to keep the prices high. You've got way more inventory than they're admitting with the shadow inventory. You've got way more construction going on than we've ever seen. So that's new inventory yeah. that's going to hit. So this whole concept of limited supply not going to last much longer is it i think the i think what we should be saying here is is we have limited afford affordable supply you know i mean i mean it's realistic i mean I, like and we do have a lack of supply in some areas i mean that is that is real but you can't say that's happening everywhere like like jack in san diego i mean if we look at san diego and the existing and the new construction i mean it is it is bad bad but then i go back to again what if you know, the builders stop building. And what if the Fed, okay, we're going to lower rates now. We're going to incentivize them to continue to build again. Well, don't forget, you know, for at least the initial, maybe a year, maybe two cycles, maybe two years, there's going to be a million. If they go to 5% rates, there's also going to be a million new list existing home listings. So then the question is, is how bad a shape will the American consumer be in by that time? And will demand be low enough for that abundance of inventory to keep the house and market sustained. And I believe that that's highly probable because again, I go back to the prices, the PE ratio, the payment to income ratio and historical precedent. And I understand like, okay, lack of supply of prices aren't going, going to go down, but that is BS dude. It, when someone says prices aren't going to go down for houses, then they better not be talking about new homes because we already, we have factual data. We don't have to use our emotions. So when people say prices aren't going down, they need to understand that they're talking about existing homes right now. And again, primary reason, golden handcuff effect. Yeah, that golden handcuffs. And that's that's something new, right? I mean, has there ever been a period in the yes. housing market where golden handcuffs was a thing like it is yes. now where people you get we have yes. seen that before? Yeah, we have. We have. And we saw that during the 1970s to the early 1970s to 1980. So from 1970 to 1982, home values went up 150 percent. OK, and then, you know, Volcker came in and jacked the interest rates, you know, like 14, 18, whatever percent. But and so there was so people, Jack, this is crazy. The consumer was so strong back in the day. People were golden handcuffed into 8 percent rates. Like if you if you had an 8 percent rate back then, it was a golden handcuff. But what OK, not only was the consumer way stronger back then, they also had a loophole called assumable mortgages. So they were just like, you know what? Yeah, the rates are 18%. But if I buy that house, I get that 9% until they basically passed a new law and legislation in Congress that stopped that because the banks were missing out on the profits and it was actually killing them. So now fast forward to today, you can only attempt a loan assumption through FHA, VA, and I believe also USDA, not unconventional though. 
Wow. We can't do that now. And, you know, one other thing that I, I, I want to mention while, while we're talking about the inevitability of home prices declining because interest rates are so high, let's also not forget that all of these existing mortgages at prior prices, they're sitting on the balance sheets of mortgage-backed securities. They're sitting on the balance sheets of banks. Um, so when that decline happens, you're going to have a lot of collateral, a lot of things that were used as a basis for a lot of this debt out there. It's going to go up in smoke. So you know, I think a lot of people are looking forward to more affordable homes and looking forward to things getting better so that, hey, maybe I can actually afford my rent. And the videos of people saying, you know, just just crying into the ether about how unaffordable life has become and justifiably so. Yeah. Well, they might get some relief from that in the form of more affordable housing and lower rents. But then, hey, by the way, the bank failure thing for March and well, that makes that worse. So you're trading one problem for another. There's really no, there's no painless way out of this. It's just, you can only spread the risk around and move it to different areas. Now, yeah, and yeah, go ahead. well, I mean, I, and I think that the whole concept, Jack, behind higher for longer, I think a lot of that is derived from the real estate market, right? I mean, come on, let's be honest, man. I mean, I, when they say that, I'm like, yeah, because the real estate market, yeah, because the shelter, yeah, because it's so slow going down. I mean, it blew up, you know, the houses blew up, but the, you know, headed down, it's so slow because every notch downward is crippling. Not only does it cripple homeowners, it can also cripple financial institutions. But also, like what you mentioned, we have this other problem that no one talks about, which is the mortgage-backed securities at 2 and 3%. That's the new subprime, Jack. The yep. new subprime is the two and three percent more. If they start selling those, man, if the Fed starts selling those and, and takes, act, they're gonna they'll take losses if they start because they're not really. I've heard a little bit of this, a little bit of that, but they're not really selling mortgage backed securities. They're just letting them roll off their books, which is basically a refinance, or someone sells their house and pays their mortgage. And guys, I know like the average person hears mortgage backed securities and they think, oh, I don't care, it doesn't affect me. Keep in mind, guys, you own that stuff, whether you realize it or not. If you deposited money in a bank anywhere, or if you have a pension or a 401k or an IRA, then you own mortgage-backed securities, whether you realize it or not. And as these interest rates have been going up, the value of those MBSs have been going down. So keep that in mind, guys. You know, Oh, MBS, I don't care about that. Yes, it does affect you. Ask anybody who owned a home or ask anybody who was alive in 2008. MBS can affect you. Absolutely. freaking lutely Travis, last thing. All right. I know there's a lot of guys out there. There's a lot of the, the millennials, the Gen Zers, the people who have been priced out of the home market, either by home prices or by interest rates. And they're just saying, when am I going to be able to get in a house? When, when am I going to be able to afford one? I'm doing everything right. I'm living beneath my means. I'm saving. I'm investing. When do you think that entry point is going to arrive. And I know it's different in every market. So let's just talk national average for a minute, right? Okay. When do well, you think it arrives? I've been doing, I've been in real estate too long to, to answer that without saying that depends on the person because affordability, it changes from person to person. Let me explain in order of importance, how do you make something affordable? Well, again, order of importance starting with number four is location. So if you want something more affordable, sometimes you're going to have no choice, even if prices go down, to find a different location. Now, second thing is, is payments, what affects payments and interest rates. So interest rates will be going down in the future, right? The Fed has told us that. And then you have the price, prices are going down now. We want them to continue to go down. And then the last thing and the most important thing is you, right? So do you have no consumer debt? Uh, you know, do you have an emergency fund saved of six months? Is only 25% of your income going to paying your mortgage? So those are things that need to happen despite what happens in the housing market. So you got to put you in front of the housing market. But as far as the housing market, I don't know, man. I mean, I think it's going to get real bad by 2025. I think unemployment is going to be the worst and most unhinged in 2025 as a result of the commercial debt implosion that's happening. It's going to be worse. And I'm trying, I try to explain this to everyone. I'm like, y'all have talked about the you know commercial real estate meltdown and commercial debt meltdown. It's not even that bad right now. It gets worse next year and even, even worse. Yep. It hasn't even in 2025. So I'm like, okay, well, they're going to be making a lot less money. If they're making less money, then they're going to cut expenses probably with labor. So that's why I'm saying 2025 because mortgage default, you know, coincides with 
unemployment. So I think in 2025, all of the horrible stuff happens. Maybe they start cutting interest rates. As they start cutting interest rates, things get worse for a while. Foreclosures start to spike, right? That's finally catching up. All of that stuff is starting to catch up. But then that's when the real opportunity happens. I think the real opportunity starts to happen in 2025. And then that's when you start seeing the institutional investors start making money. But be before that, Jack, <clears throat> you know, I think that you prepare before that. If I find a house tomorrow that hits my list of things that I want, I'm going to buy it. But my list, I'm not going to settle. I want, I'm going to buy a house at 2019 or lower value. Okay, so that's on my list, right? So that's like number one. So the thing is, is I've defined my goals and my goals have shaped my approach on what I'm looking for. So again, it, you know, if I find a distressed seller that's going to give me the things that I want, I will buy a house tomorrow. But if I'm going to, and I hate to say this, but if I time the, the market, which you should not time the market, you got to work on you. You got to understand your goals. I'm going to say 2025, it's going to get ugly. Maybe that's when they go back down to 5% rates. Maybe in the six percent, who knows? So it sounds like regardless of when the bottom is, and it, and that was a great point. Nobody times the market perfectly, right? Uh, there's right. people out there who claim they do. Nobody really does. Um, some people get lucky. Some people don't. Most don't. Um, Most don't. But it sounds like 2024 is going to be another year for patience. And I know a lot of people out there probably don't want to hear that. A lot, especially a lot of those younger guys who who maybe they're doing everything right, and the market still has not. Um, rewarded that but it sounds like another year of patience ahead for most people but but i do think it's going to be a different type of patience jack i think i think 2024 patience is oh my god i don't want to buy too soon like oh, oh my gosh I, I see a good deal i got to get that right now I, I think the patience is is like i'm starting to see some good deals maybe i should just wait a little long a little bit longer so i get a little bit better and i, I know we just said don't time the bottom you know bottom of the market but I think 2024 is going to be a real true test of patience. And like, how long do you want to wait to find a great deal? I think that's 2024. But I think 2025 is like, I think it's, you can't ignore it. I think it's everywhere. Also, it's going to be a new president. And we don't know, is Congress going to be split? But I mean, that's another thing that there's going to be no more bailout. There's going to be no more money printing. They're heading into election. Who, who's, going to, who's going to authorize? The war was special, right? Um there's no lifeline, man. Other than that reverse repo market, when that reverse repo market's gone, where's the lifeline? There's no lifeline. The yeah. earliest that happens is 2025, right? So we're in for some hell, quite frankly. Yeah. And, you know, in the meantime, folks, the cost to rent is still substantially below the cost to own. I mean, the cost of rent is also pretty outrageous right now, but, you know, the, the market is rewarding patience right now. So it sounds like more patience is still called for. Travis, oh, yeah. I want to thank you so much for your time and for sharing your work with us. I really appreciate it. phenomenal stuff that the driving through the subdivisions and looking at how much inventory is really out there. Amazing stuff. Um, I'll give you the last word. Anything you want to throw in before we wrap this up? I would say if there's anyone that's watching this, that's on the sideline, whether they're choosing to be on the sideline to find a great deal or whether they're forced on the sideline, you know, don't give up hope. In fact, right now is you do kind of have a great opportunity to empower yourself and to wait for a great opportunity. Now I've made personally, Jack, there's no, I get no money for this. There's no fee, but I've made a home buying course and I'm, and it's free. So if you want to go to my community section, you want to go to about me on my channel, real estate mindset, I have a free home buying course. I just got done with chapter two. I'm going to upload that. But the reason that I've made that is, is again, I'm not saying for people to buy, I'm saying instead of getting depressed or, uh, you know, having anxiety on the sideline, for the love of God, learn how to buy. Put yourself on an even playing field with these investors. Now, we can't have the liquidity, but maybe I could teach some people some tricks and some strategies to at least help level the playing field. So I would say continue to be patient. And if you're forced on the sideline, you missed a bullet. Be thankful. Don't be discouraged. But also, the last thing I say, don't drink, budget, right? Don't go out to party, stay home, and rebudget. I guarantee almost everyone watching this has way too many subscriptions. For one. Yeah. Great stuff, Travis. Thank you so much for taking the time to be with us and for sharing your work with us. Again, guys, that's Real Estate Mindset. I'm going to put a link down in the description to his channel. Also, check out his free real estate course. He's giving it away, guys. Take it. Put the work in now. Exercise some patience. Do the DD. And then when the market provides you a good entry point, you'll be ready and you'll know what to do. Thanks again, Travis, for joining us. Everybody, until next time, live small and dream big.